All right, so uh, we'll get started. Uh, we're going to cover, uh, basically, we're going to apply those transformations that we introduced yesterday, rotations and boosts, and look at how they arise in uh, um, different situations. Um, mostly with rotations, we're going to look at uh, differential delay between the two, um, the two signals, the two polarizations, and forms of cross-coupling that maintain orthogonality of, the, of your basis. And that's rotations about the line of sight and um, introduction of ellipticity of the receptors. For example, if you're assuming that your receptors are purely linearly polarized, uh, if, if they become elliptical but still remain orthogonal, uh, that's, that's also a rotation of your basis. And then we'll look at boosts and how non-orthonormality of the receptors can lead to these uh, boost transformations. And then I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about how we can take these things and apply them to parameterize an instrumental response. And um, before just jumping and saying this is the response, I'm going to maybe share some ideas about what are the criteria for selecting a model. There's lots of different parameterizations out there, lots of different approaches using Jones matrices and Mueller matrices. So how do you decide what, what is a good mathematical model for, uh, for your instrument? Um, before I run away and start talking about these things, I, I thought I'd define what is meant by orthonormality of the receptors. So they are both orthogonal, so their inner product is zero, and they're normalized such that they have unit length. Um, so you could put a um, little hat symbol on top of them. I don't know how that... <laughs> <laughs> Someone is able to draw on the slides. On the slides. Um, so sorry, that's me. I'm having some problems. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. All right. It's, it's not a problem now. I don't think it should be a problem. <laughs> so for, first, we're going to look at these rotations. And I'm going to break them down into three basic rotations. The first one we'll look at is this differential phase, differential delay, or in optics, retardation, or some, some people also call it the cross-hand phase. Um, so I'm going to say we'll start by considering a pair of orthonormal receptors. So the little hat on H0 and H1 on the right there indicates that they have, they have unit length. And then I'm going to delay uh, the signal from one by using some phase, phase delay. And I'm using 2 phi there uh, just to show how we can decompose that. Uh, so the Jones matrix that's given by or described by those two receptors I can factor out the phase term into a separate matrix that multiplies the purely ortho, orthonormal basis. And then I can divide out or, or um, take out a common factor of e to the i phi. So I end up with e to the i phi in the top, top left, left hand corner and e to the minus i phi in the bottom. The first one determinant. It's the determinant that will be uh, one in, in, this, in the middle. Yeah, yeah. So that, th this is a, you could say, a polar decomposition. That absolute phase term, I don't care about. I can throw it away. Um, the middle, um, the, the one on the far right is a rotation matrix. Uh, you can show that if you multiply that H, H0, H1 dagger by its Hermitian transpose, you'll get the uni unity matrix. What's left is another rotation matrix. So this, this polar decomposition just separated the two rotation matrices, if you will. The reason for doing this is we can take that middle matrix, which is a, is a rotation. We can write it in the form that we wrote for an arbitrary rotation matrix. It's just the identity matrix times cosine phi plus i times the first Pali matrix. So if you remember the Pali, the first one was diagonal. It has a one in the upper left-hand corner and a negative one in the bottom right-hand corner. And when you add those, two together, you get the e to the i phi and e to the minus i phi on the, on the diagonal. So this is a rotation about the axis defined by that unit vector n. And if you're in the linear basis, that would be the Stokes q axis, for example. So you'd just be rotating Stokes u into Stokes v. That's basically what happens with differential delay in the linear basis. If you were in a circular basis, that first um, axis would be the Stokes Stokes v axis, 
and rotations, di differential phase rotations would result in a rotation about the Stokes V axis, which would rotate Q into U, which is identical to rotating your receiver about the line of sight. So tell me how the, the end hat there, I'm, I'm, I'm quite frustrated. So tell me how you get one zero zero out of that. So the, the one zero zero comes from the fact that there are only two terms in this sum. Uh, and the, you could write the, the full sum out and say, well, that's plus zero times sigma two plus zero times sigma pi. So I'll, I'll remind you that the notation for the rotation up here. So we were saying any rotation about an arbitrary axis by an angle phi is given by the cosine of phi times the identity matrix plus i times this inner product of, um, I'll call this the vector here, this sigma vector times the sine of phi. And that, this funny sigma vector is the, the vector oh, that has- only a sigma one component, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you get, I mean, I could draw them, but I'll, I'll just say, but maybe I will draw them just so you, it's useful. So we have sigma one, which is one minus one, and sigma two, which is one right there, and sigma three, which is i minus i. That's why we call it effect particle in quantum mechanics, because there's three of them. It's exactly the same. As, uh, I can't, I can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't get the reflection off that board, sorry. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Um, I can take pictures of yeah. the Matt, Matt will take a photo. Uh, I, guess um, the, I guess this equation is also in the, th the previous notes. Uh, <coughs> so that's where the, the unit vector n, n equals one zero zero comes from, because there's no sigma two or sigma three component to this, this transformation, the, the differential phase transformation. But there is when we consider receptor ellipticity. So now uh, this rotation matrix uh, has these I sine epsilon terms on the off diagonal. And that's the same as uh, introducing uh, opposite senses of ellipticity to the two receptors. Wait, go back and then just go backwards and forwards. So you've got the same thing on the left hand side. It's Rn hat of phi. Yeah. And then you've got n hat of epsilon. Yeah. So in each each of these slides, only n hat is changing. So the, this this oh. yeah, <laughs> I could give them a different name on each slide, but basically, um, this oh. this matrix here can be decomposed into cosine epsilon times the identity matrix, which gives us the cosine epsilon on the diagonal, plus i times the sine of epsilon times the uh, second basis matrix, which is the one one matrix basis, which it gives us I sine epsilon on the off diagonal terms. And this would be equivalent to um, a receptor having a pair of orthogonally polarized receptors with opposite ellipticities using that notation that Stokes introduced. Enjoy it. Enjoy the two ellipses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll erase this. So ba basically, uh, in Stokes's work, he identified orthogonally polarized receptors as any uh, any pair of. So I think he used. Well, I'll, I'll stick to the angle of theta. So any pair of ellipses that have orthogonal major axes, and they have the same ellipticity. But the electric field is going around them in opposite directions. Can you trace the tips of both ellipses with both in the simultaneity? Because I'm trying to uh, In fact, it doesn't matter. The, the phase, the absolute phase of where those. Where, where this, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but basically, yeah, as a function of, this would be for a monochromatic wave. So they, each of these electric field vectors would complete one cycle of the ellipse in the same amount of time. But they would travel these ellipses in opposite directions. So that in, in Stokes's language, receptors are orthogonal. Let's say you have receptor one 
uh, I've been using H. I'll stick to the notation on the slides. So H zero parameterized by beta zero and ellipticity zero, and H one parameterized by beta one and ellipticity one. His definition of orthogonality that he derived would be uh, beta zero is offset by beta one by 90 plus or minus 90 degrees. And the ellipticities are opposite. Uh, so same. So this matrix here corresponds to what exactly? Does it correspond to changing one of your receptors? Both. Or moving one of them? Both receptors here. Let's say we started out with linearly polarized receptors. They're both being uh, fat, fattened out into a circle by the same amount, and, but with opposite handedness. Are we assuming orthogonality? Yes, we're starting with an orthogonal pair of receptors. Yeah. So you've got an orthogonal pair of linear receptors. You're flattening out the linear lips and to the matrix like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what that matrix there is telling you. And the fattening that's right. Epsilon. Sorry, the, the fattening is epsilon. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So if epsilon is as epsilon approaches 45 degrees, these would become circular. I was going to say that. So if it's pi by four, then it would be a circle. Yep. Yep. In opposite directions. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Um, Willem, sorry. So um, this so this this matrix is is describing uh, um, a um, how can I say. Um, a problem in the in the fits, so it's something that we might aim to correct with this, or is simply like a description? Yeah, it's a good question. This this would be classified as crosstalk or um, the D terms in the Hamaker, Bregman, and Salt um, equations. Is one of the is one of the pieces of the that 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 um, describes the leakage, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So we would call these leakage terms, but the fact because they're symmetric in this equation, uh, or you could say equal and opposite, they they maintain the orthogonality of the basis. So your 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 ideally linearly polarized receptors are responding to elliptically polarized radiation, mm. still responding to orthogonal senses of elliptically polarized radiation. So there's no non-orthogonality non in, uh, in this expression. Non-orthogonality uh, I'll, I'll show in a, in a little bit. So could you say that again, please? Uh, the, oh, the, no, the yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I was sorry. Yeah. yeah. But, but so I mean, this is only this is only uh, describing the orientation of the fits now. So it's not describing any 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 um, um, imperfection. So it's not trying to. Dis if um if you thought your receptors were should be responding to only linearly polarized or maximally responding to linearly polarized mm -hmm. then it, you could call this an imperfection but it's not an imperfection that is non-orthogonal <laughs> or or creates non-orthogonality of your receptors so but maybe if we look at that n hat vector it's its basis is the stokes u or the, the stokes u direction so positive values of e in this case would rotate so let's say you've got receptors that you think are responding to X and Y. So the X receptor, its Stokes vector would be positive Stokes Q. And the Y receptor would have a Stokes vector that points in the negative Stokes Q direction. Mm -hmm. And this thing's going to rotate th those two receptors around. So they remain anti-parallel mm -hmm. in Stokes space. So they remain orthogonal, but they're now pointing slightly, one of them's pointing towards Stokes V and one of them's pointing towards negative Stokes V okay. direction. Uh, so you, so they're responding to elliptically polarized radiation, but they're still or orthogonal. I'm not sure if I can uh, visualize a physical situation like a area uh, that in which this can happen. I understand what you're saying, uh, but I, I cannot um, I cannot visualize a, a, um, like a, real, a real situation in which the fits might suffer from this. 
yeah it's, <laughs> it's also maybe a bit difficult because it's the off diagonal terms here are pure, purely imaginary uh, which mm -hmm. is a bit hard to see it as a like a phase yeah shall i draw them up on the board yeah so i'm going to put the well, Okay. The I, yeah, rotations in general have uh, that maybe it would be good to put those equations back up. I'll erase this bit that's the The general form of the rotation has I in it. There is an I. Without that I, we get a boost. That's the main difference. Are you able to? Well, it's just the same. It's just an imaginary Yeah, yeah. You can think of it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right around, it's just a rotation about the line of sight, but we're just taking the electric field vector and rotating it by uh, theta about, about the, in this case, about the line of sight, which turns out to be the Stokes V axis. So again, we can break this matrix down to look like the, the form of the, the general form of the rotation matrix, where here we, the I times minus I gives us a positive sine theta, and the i times i gives us the negative sine theta on the, on the other side of the di off diagonal terms. And that, that's what allows us to write it in this form. So th there we have the basic, the three basic rotations about the three axes, one due to differential phase, uh, one due to re receptor ellipticity that preserves orthogonality, <laughs> and one due to a rotation about the line of sight. This rotation about the line of sight, if you didn't expect it, could also be thought of as crosstalk, um, where we now have off diagonal components that represent mixing between. What's the difference between this one and the first one? Go back to it. Yep. So, uh, different computer. <laughs> so the differential phase is purely on the diagonal. But that's okay, because so is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Why is that? Oh, this is not. I learned some other rotation about the line of sight. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're, these are all. Is it is it something again that is uh, related to the receiver? Because this sounds, I mean, reminds a lot of the parallactic angle. Yeah, yeah. So the rotation of the receiver about the line of sight. Okay. All right. 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 So this is the parallactic angle. Yeah. Or or okay. say an unmodeled engineering error where they they mounted the receiver mm. off from vertical as expected or, or something like that. Could, could come into this. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, some, when you model this as a function of frequency, you see it vary. And so you think, well, why, why would the apparent orientation of the receiver vary with frequency? And that's because cross-coupling between the channels can 
uh, induce an effect that looks like a rotation. And if that cross that you know that electronic cross coupling varies with frequency, then the apparent rotation of your receiver also does. So this this would happen if you have um, an as Antenna, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, so tomorrow when we look at how do we actually determine these receiver parameters, how do we determine an unknown instrumental response? Uh, we use the uh, the fact that the receiver rotates with respect to the sky to model how the response varies as a function of that, that angle, that parallactic angle. Is everyone happy with rotations so far? Because we're about to get into boosts, which are a little slightly more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> wow, OK, that's cool. Uh, I actually had a small question on the uh, uh, ellipticity. Do you, do you actually assume that the ellipticity, ellipticity of both the receptors are the same? In, in, this, um, in this equation, receptor one would have a positive ellipticity and receptor two would have a negative e ellipticity. Negative but equal? Negative but equal, yeah. So they remain or orthogonal in that sense defined by Stokes. Um, right. E equal and opposite ellipticities and orientations offset by, by 90 degrees or plus, plus or minus 90 degrees. Okay. Is it is it always the case that the that the ellipticity uh, ellipt 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 of the two receivers is the same but opposite? I uh, know. So that's what we'll look at next. Is what happens when some ellipticity? So what what happens when the receptors get e elliptical but they aren't equal and opposite in ellipticity? And that that you would describe as receptor non orthogonality, and, and that that leads to a Lorentz boost of the Stokes four vector. Okay, because basically, let's say that if we if we think to to the lattice as a sort of uh, as a sort of or, uh, orientation of the fields with respect to each other, now we have uh, the same orientation, and later we will have non orientation. That means non orthogonality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, either orientation or ellipticity. So if the receptors orientations aren't offset from each other by 90 degrees or the ellipticities are not equal and opposite then then those receptors are no longer orthogonal and in both of those cases we'd get a boost um, so I, maybe, maybe I'll jump to that next and that'll make it a little more clear um, actually I, unless there are any other questions about rotations All right. Um, boosts. So before you go on, can I tell you my understanding of what you've just done? Yep. What you've done is said there's only three ways to do this, corresponding to the first, second, and third components of your F. Yeah, yeah. Which is a non-trivial observation. Yeah. Because there's only three things you can do. You might think you can do this, 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 this. No, you've only got three. Yeah, yeah. And those are the three that you've got. Yeah, that's right. To me, the interesting thing is not here's one, oh, and another one, oh, and another one. The thing is, you've only got three, mate. Here they are. Yeah, you, not four. you can think of them as the basis rotations. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what's interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, I, 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 no, I agree. I think that's really interesting. And it's a good point to, to make. So, bo boost transformations, I'm just going to uh, <laughs> remind us what we're talking about when we're talking about orth orthonormality. We're talking about two things orthogonality and normalized. And so the first one we'll knock over is if they're not normalized or let's say they're normalized differently. So we, we could call that differential gain or di attenuation. So now we're going to have these receptors that have different lengths or different gains if you want to think of that. So H1, sorry, H0 has gain G0, H1 has gain G1. And we can think consider their they're, they're still orthogonal, so we can consider their orthonormal unit vectors, which are just the, the vectors normalized by their gains. <coughs> and again, we can do this decomposition of the Jones matrix for those two, uh, so we can break it apart into the uh, unitary 
you know, orthogonal basis represented by H naught hat and H one hat on the right. And they're each multiplied by some scalar real valued gain on the diagonal of this matrix. And then we factor out the determinant. So G, big G, as shown in the bottom left there, is just the determinant or the square root of the determinant of that uh, matrix, the resulting matrix. So when we factor that out, we're left with that gain ratio, the square root of the gain ratio on the diagonal. So you get a gamma and inverse gamma on the diagonal of this um, resulting matrix. Now the, the thing to note here is this, this resulting matri matrix is, those are real valued, gamma is real valued. So this is a symmetric uh, matrix. Uh, I guess it's, yeah, it's Hermitian. So it's not equal to its, um, its own, so it's Hermitian transpose is not equal to its inverse. So it's not unitary. So it's definitely a Hermitian or a boost, boost matrix. So how do we parameterize that boost? Well, we can define gamma to be the exponential of beta. So that allows us to write e to the beta in the upper left corner and e to the minus beta in the bottom left-hand corner. And now we can decompose this matrix into a boost, which is the hyperbolic cosine times the identity matrix plus the hyperbolic sine of beta times the first Pauli matrix. With no i. With no i, yeah. So now we get sums, the sums of cosh x plus the, or the hyperbolic cosine plus the hyperbolic sine gives us the exponential of beta and their difference gives us the exponential of mi minus beta. So this is a boost along the m hat axis defined by one zero zero. So differential gain in this case is going to mix if, you, if we're in this linear basis with, with where our receptors are described by plus and minus Stokes Q this differential gain is going to um, mix Stokes Q and Stokes I and leave, pretty much leave uh, Stokes U and V unchanged. Yeah, so it, it's going to, maybe the way, so that, um, the way to picture it is, is every, every Stokes vector in three-dimensional space is going to be rotated up towards this boost axis. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to kind of squash everything towards that. Yeah. It does also. It doesn't preserve power. That's right. So the total intensity changes. Yeah. 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 Which part? <laughs> yeah. So if you think of any arbitrary Stokes vector. Because u and v aren't changed, it's going to be pushed in or boosted in the Stokes, Stokes q direction. So the resulting vector will lie in the plane defined by the original vector and this m hat vector. So you could think of it as a, a squashing or a rotation, but there's also a stretching of the vector. So the, the vector length changes, and that's in the three dimensional space. This corresponds to strengthening one and weakening the other, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, well, you also said that this differential gain mixes two of the Stokes parameters, I and Q in this one. Yeah, if you have linearly polarized receptors. If you had circularly polarized receptors and you're in the basis where S1 points in the Stokes V direction, then you would be mixing I and V yeah, with differential gain. And that kind of comes out from. Uh, let's see if we, can, we, we can just draw that quite simply, I guess, where we think of uh, Stokes I as um, the power in X plus the power in Y, for example, in, in, and then Stokes Q as being the difference in X, X, and Y. If you, if you started out with, let's say um, this just equals, let's say they're equal in power. So there's two times some, some number, let's call it t, <laughs> and this is zero. So xx x, x equals yy equals some number t, right? So 
because they're equal, we can think of this as unpolarized radiation, at least along this axis. But now if we boost one, we, we multiply this one by some uh, gain and we suppress the other by dividing it by that same gain, uh, we're gonna we're gonna produce a positive Stokes Q, and we're gonna change the total intensity. So we could, this the, these boost transformations can polarize un, unpolarized light, but they can't depolarize 100% polarized light. <laughs> but well, it's not it's not the mixing exactly. It's um, I mean is. It, it seems to that there is nothing from from i that goes into q isn't it? no sorry that's incorrect sorry ignore it okay but it is a if we wrote it out in the full Mueller matrix sense you would see that i goes into q as well yeah and you maybe you could say that as q started out as zero and after the transformation q was non-zero so you could say unpolarized flux or total intensity went into Stokes Q. Maybe I should draw it. Should I write it out completely? <laughs> Instead of just kind of. No, is that, I mean, the, I think my, my confusion comes because it's not that here, it's, it's exactly, um, I mean, it, it seems that this boost comes from the instrument itself, not, not from, uh, if, if I can explain myself, so, so not from a, a real um, uh, transfer of power from I to Q. This. That, that's right, it's, the, it's an instrumental distortion. But it need not necessarily be instrumental. For example, if you had preferential attenuation or di attenuation in a in a cloud of gas, for example, um, then you could also convert unpolarized flux into, into polarized flux. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll write this out fully. So if you know if we had um, some e prime divided by x prime y prime, uh, that's just this boost. Times the original Maybe Can I'll, you be a bit more loud, Willem? Yeah, okay. And I'll, I'll share Thanks. the. I'll stop sharing the slides so you can see what's on the board a little more, a, a bit better. So we're we're just transforming the electric field vector by this by this boost, and then we can look at well, what happens to x. x X star and Y Y star, and we're just get X X star uh, being equal to two beta times the original X X star and Y Y star minus two beta times the original Y Y star. Then we can ask how how does that change? Stokes I. Well, if these, you know, these started out as T, right? But we said up here, we, each of them was equal to some value T. So we get a equal to two beta T into the minus two beta T. So our resulting total intensity I prime would be uh, e to the two beta plus T to the minus two beta. Give us the hyperbolic cosine of two beta times t, and then q prime being the difference of these would be e to the two beta minus two beta minus two beta. I think that would give us the hyperbolic sine of two beta. Could you could you hear that? Clearly, Vivek, on that side? Yes. Thanks. I'm not speaking loud enough for Zoom to lock on to this video. So maybe maybe if I speak right into the microphone for a while, uh, it doesn't seem to be switching. <laughs> or is it on your end? Oh, yeah, it is. OK. So you guys can see the, the board clearly as well? 
Yes, we could pin your video. Uh, okay, yeah, you can do that on that side. Okay. Yeah. So th this is this Lorentz boost transformation in the case of differential gain between the two receptors. So really, we're just addressing the non-normalized nature of the, or the, the fact that they don't share the same scale, let's say. <laughs> so this seems like what we created as because like that, right? But you mentioned that the boost can be happening somewhere else outside the instrument. Can we extract it? Or it's going to be... Uh, I'm getting a little bit outside of my realm of memory here, but I think Tom Thompson scattering is an example where you'd um, get preferential uh, reflection or scattering of one of the polarizations. And that, that you could see that as a die attenuation. So you have your own boost and then you get those boost from somewhere else? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So your instrument can boost the signal and nature can boost, boost the signal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's why we do it. Yeah. That's why you do it. Yeah. I think it's about to be a car. Isn't car hard for you to be a fuzzy instrument? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Oops. We get it too fuzzy on both. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Now we could stop there and say there's an example of orthogonality, but I think it's kind of, oh sorry, an example of a boost, but I think it's kind of neat to look at the case of uh, non-orthogonality as well. So here, instead of uh, having, uh, what do we, oh yeah, so now, now instead of having orthogonal receptors with different gains, we're gonna have, receptors with unit gains that are non-orthogonal. So their uh, inner product does not equal zero. And we'll look at how does that uh, translate into a, um, a boost. But before we do that, we'll, I'll, I'll just introduce a way of determining the boost given a Jones matrix. So up, up on the top there. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry, I get only half of the slide. Yeah, me too. Okay. Yeah, me too. Okay. That's weird. <laughs> How's that? Uh, still the same. So are you guys seeing the screen? Maybe I'll stop share and try again just to see what happens. I'll just share this screen and see what happens. Yes, that's better. It's still, okay, yeah, that looks good. Yes. Thanks, Vivek. No problem. Uh, do, do you want me to go back to the previous slide? So this was just showing receptors that have are normalized, so they have unit magnitude or unit gain, but they're non-orthogonal, so their inner, inner product does not equal zero. Right. And it, but before we jump in, I'm just introducing this way that you can actually determine the Hermitian component of a Jones matrix. Um, so the top row shows that polar decomposition, where I've, I've explicitly mentioned that the, the, the factor that the scalar factor that gets is the first term on the, on the right-hand side, is that the, the square root of the determinant of the the Jones matrix. And then what you're left with are the unimodular boost and rotation. And when you multiply J by its Hermitian transpose, um, the rotation times its Hermitian transpose imme immediately cancels out because it's, 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 it, its Hermitian transpose is its inverse, so you get the identity. And you get left with the boost squared because it's equal to its Hermitian transpose. And then you're multiplying the determinant of, of J, which is a complex number, by its complex conjugate, so you, and, and then taking the square root. So you end up with uh, the magnitude of this complex number, the, de the determinant of J. And a boost squared by some impact. So if you 
boost something along the same axis by the same impact factor beta, it's like boosting along that axis by, by two beta. So th I guess this slide is an uh, aside or an, uh, uh, this is this this slide is independent of any orthogonality or non-orthogonality yeah, receptors. Like lost the location, so, and it's, it doesn't matter. Maybe, maybe the better way to think of it is when I multiply J any matrix by its Hermitian transpose, the unitary component disappears, and I'm I'm left with just the Hermitian component squared. And then it doesn't matter if it's orthogonal or non-orthogonal. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. For, for both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'd say that the, the rotate, all three of the rotation types that you've given are unitary matrices. Yeah. Therefore disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All comes down to Cauchy's product formula, the determinant of a product as opposed to the determinant. It's, it's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. you know it's there, you see it everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to use linear It's a linear function of beta. Yeah, I I think that's right. So we're going to use this uh, property uh, to determine the boost component of a receiver that has non-orthogonal receptors. So we're going to do that here. We're starting on the top row, just showing what is this J J dagger when you have uh, these vec um, these two receptors describing the unit the the Jones matrix. So JJ dagger gives us this matrix that has ones on the diagonal, and then the inner product between the two receptors on the off diagonal, and it's just the um, th this matrix is Hermitian. So what appears in the bottom left is just the complex conjugate of what appears on the Upper right. I'm laughing because you've written set there, which is an abomination. Yes. <laughs> I've never seen it in my life before. No, LaTeX hadn't either, so I had to define it. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Just right. Hyperbolic C completely. So uh, the, the inner product between the two receptors is just a complex number. And so what I'm doing on the second line down here is just parameterizing that complex number in terms of its magnitude or the hyperbolic tangent of a number to, to beta and then it, and its phase. So I'm just introducing this uppercase phi here as the phase of that complex number and I don't really uh, mind too much right now what it is. I'm more interested in the magnitude of this, um, uh, this number. And the, re the reason for parameterizing the magnitude as the hyperbolic tangent is uh, it, it, we're, we're basically trying to shift this equation in the direction of looking like a boost, which has hyperbolic cosines and sines. So that, that tells us what the j, j dagger is. So now we want to determine the determinant of j. And we use the fact that it's the determinant of j, j dagger uh, if we take the square root of that. So the, um, I guess this is again using the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants and then if we take the complex argument of that it's just the, the magnitude of that, that determinant so and that determinant is easy to compute it's just one minus the square of the inner product between those receptors and then take the square root again and because I've parameterized the square of the or I've parameterized the inner product in terms of the hyperbolic tangent I get this abomination called the hy hyperbolic secant, which is just really one over the hyperbolic cosine of two, two beta. I'm sure you remember my analytic number. I think set squared is one minus half squared. Yes, yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yeah. One silly question, probably an analytic silly, but um, if you have non orthogonal um, uh, receiver, and uh, you play with boost. Is it possible just to do them look like orthogonal when you play with the boost to um, introducing? 
just to, to make them look like they are from the moon. No, it's the moon at the same time. Yeah, the only, the only boost that, I, that could maybe convert a non-orthogonal basis would be the, I guess, the equal and opposite. I, I'd have to think about that. Like You'd want the inverse of the boost, no, basically. Like, for example, you can't fix mechanically. Um, you can't do it properly mechanically. But can you play with the boost uh, just to pretend that it looks like a combinal? Right, so yeah, the, if you if you know the boost, you can multiply the electric field vector that you've measured by yeah, so by the you, inverse of that boost. Just to pretend that your your thing is a combinal that yeah. can be. Like to fix it, I'm not yeah, it's like calibration. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what, yeah, what calibration is. Like if I go with backwards, can I do this? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, maybe it was too obvious when you asked. No, that. no, it's kind of where, we're, where we'll jump tomorrow is looking at what is calibration. And basically, it's multiplying everything by the inverse of the Jones matrix. So I have to play with two different boosts uh, to, uh, separately, right? Yeah. The different boosts. Or they, I have to give them the same at the same time. Similar value. Uh, I'll show. You'll see on maybe at the end of this presentation okay. what what it looks like in the okay. end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So this is kind of just setting things up to look like a boost. So we take now the boost, which is parameterized by two beta. It's just the Jones matrix times its Hermitian transpose divided by the determinant. But we've set everything up to look like things in terms of hyperbolic cosines and sines. And the reason for doing that and the reason for choosing two beta is because we ultimately want to compute the Jones matrix, the single boost parameterized by, by beta. But maybe the main thing to take away from this is I. Whereas all of the other ones that we've been looking at so far ended up with only two terms, this one has three. And what I've disguised here is that m hat now contains that phase term. So I have a cosine uppercase phi along the Stokes u axis or the S2 axis and a sine uppercase phi on the Stokes v axis or the S3 axis if we're, if we're in this linear basis. So orthogonality, Non-orthogonality results in a boost along an axis that goes in the, if you will, the UV plane. This is kind of nice because the other one went along the, the Q axis. So now we've got all three axes covered again by these, this combination of boosts. Um, and you could think of the cos phi term as a, the difference in the ellipticities of the receptors. And likewise, the sine phi term that, co that creates the boost along the Stokes V axis as the difference in the orientations of the receptors. So again, this is related to ellipticity and orientation, but now we're considering the non-orthogonals, that you could say the delta, delta epsilons and the delta thetas, the, the, the things that make the receptors non-orthogonal. That's the main point to take away from this slide. This one was maybe the most algebra algebraically complex. And when I first started putting the slides together, this was the first one I did, but then I thought we really should kind of ease into it with some rotations first, because they're kind of the easier one to understand or, or follow conceptually. Wait, the determinant of is yeah, so the determinant turned out to be one over this hyperbolic, oops, uh, one over the hyperbolic secant. So when I divide by that determinant, I get the, the, the cosine or the hyperbolic cosine. And that's what gives us the hyperbolic cosine on the diagonal. And then the, uh, the tan, the hyperbolic tangent, which was on the off diagonal, multiplied by the hyperbolic cosine gives us the hyperbolic sine on the off diagonal terms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so th uh, this is basically showing how we have three basis rotation mat matrices that allow us to rotate our frame around all, all three axes. And we have two 
um, boosts, but they cover, again, all three axes, boost, boosting along S1 due to differential gain and boosting along S2 and S3 due to non-orthogonality of the receptors. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Willem. Um, yep. can, I, can I ask a naive question here? Yeah. Um, what does phi represent again? The uppercase phi? Yes. It was kind of a placeholder here for the phase. Uh, where did we introduce it? We kind of introduced it as a placeholder for the phase of this complex number that is the inner product between the receptors. Uh, so at first, we just introduced it as a way of holding the phase of this complex number. But what um, what would could be possible to show? I've never tried it, but I. Um, Actually, I'll, we'll see um, at the end of these slides, there's a parameterization that shows how these non-orthogonality parameters lead to boosts in a, in a different way. And that, um, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly that the Stokes U boost is due to the difference in the ellipticities and the Stokes V boost is due to the non-orthogonality non due to the different or orientations of the receptors. So you could say any part of the ellipticities of the receptors that doesn't satisfy the, fact, the condition that they should be equal and opposite contributes to the cos phi part of this equation. And any difference in the orientations that keep, um, does not satisfy the, that the receptors should be oriented at 90 degrees with respect to each other would contribute to the sine phi term in this equation. I might have that switched around, but this is, uh, so I'm just basing it on my reasoning right now. We'll see at the end. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Because you've got, if phi is equal to zero, or 0 0.0000001, the only component that makes any difference is the second one. Yeah. Which is, what is going on? Yeah, the, the, the ellipticity. The, the yeah. ellipticity. Yeah, yeah. So we're kind of describing everything about the receptors, their gains, their orientations, their ellipticities, and, and how this would change the boosts and rotations that we would use to describe that, uh, those, those receptors, or the Jones matrix composed of, of those receptors. Uh, so I think we're in a position now to talk about the full instrumental response. But before we jump in, I'm just going to uh, muse for a while about what what it, what makes a good model. And uh, I'm just putting these four uh, attributes here. Uh, so and any model of the instrument should be numerically stable, and it should be complete. Like it should have at least those seven degrees of freedom that we know exist in the Jones matrix. It should be self-consistent. So if we're talking about, you know, linear transformations of the electric field, the resulting Mueller matrix that we derive shouldn't be impure, for example. And separable just means, uh, by separable, I just mean different, different components of your instrument might need to be calibrated more regularly than other components of your instrument. So it'd be nice if you could isolate and identify those components that you want to say update before every observation from the ones that change on very long time scales like months uh, for example choose any two yeah <laughs> yeah that's a good question there may be interdependencies there yeah <laughs> So in one line, but I'm not sure right now in this Yeah, I'll I'll expand on them. <laughs> so numerical stability, mostly, I I my thinking about this came from trying to model instrumental responses using something like least squares minimization. So I was using the levenberg mccart algorithm, which requires a gradient matrix to be computed. 
and that it's often called the Hessian matrix. And if that matrix is not invertible, then you end up with a, a problem you can't solve. So things that would make it non-invertible would be uh, two. Well, non Right. Two or three or sometimes four out of twenty eigenvalues are negative. Wow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, so I haven't yeah, encountered well, that I'm yet. I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. 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 It's a much more serious. Yeah. Pernicious problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. So typically, a, a non invertible Hessian matrix shows that maybe you have too many model parameters. So some of your model parameters are 100% covariant or um, your model, your data and your model are completely insensitive to one of the parameters. So all of the partial derivatives of your, your, your goodness of fit function with respect to that parameter go to zero. And so one way that can happen, so this is just looking at Conway and Kronberg's parameterization of uh, the response in the right circular and left circular polarizations. And what they include is they say, well, if your VR is equal to your ER plus a bit of EL, where a bit of EL is parameterized by epsilon one and some phase phi one. If those are your model parameters, epsilon one and phi one, they actually, you actually become very unstable at the ideal solution. So as epsilon one approaches zero, you have no idea what phi one is, any, any phi one would do. And that would cause your Hessian matrix to become non-invertible, for example. So, so these kinds of problems can creep in. And you could say, well, we'll just fix that by, you know, instead of writing the that, That's the same thing as having, you, you multiply the origin in polar coordinates. Yeah. And the, the angle becomes a determinant of the origin. But even if your point is close to the origin. Yeah. Before I forget, the other pathology that you get is that you have got hard constraints in your optimization problems, such as non-negativity and maybe non-positive definiteness. Quite often, your maximum will be quite bang snap, snap against the um, it'll have its nose against your hard constraint. Yeah. And then your Hessian is not guaranteed to be anything at all. Right, right. Yeah. Because your derivatives are zero, and so the Hessian problem increases. Yeah. So there, there are pernicious problems that come from a non well selected model all, all over the place. Yeah. And it's easy for you because you've only got seven by seven. Yes. <laughs> for the most part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you need to choose carefully. It, this one problem you could say would go away if you stopped parameterizing that complex number by its magnitude and phase and instead parameterized it by its real and imaginary components. Uh, it's possible that this problem goes away with that, that parameterization. I haven't thought too much about it. But I, actually, um, this problem kind of, so this, this, this equation was set in 1969, but a, a lot of people have followed suit. So Steinbring et al. in 1984 have a very similar problem where Again, on the off-diagonal terms here, you can see the epsilon one and epsilon two multiplied by some phase factor. And again, as those um, epsilons go to zero, uh, psi one and psi two will become unconstrainable or, or um, you say your Hessian matrix is either non-invertible or, or poorly conditioned uh, near the ideal case. Uh, sorry, Vidam. Can you just uh, quickly remind what are epsilon one, two, and psi one, zero, and two? Yeah. So the, this is how they've chosen to parameterize crosstalk or un unexpected uh, mixing uh, bet mm. between the receptors. So in the ideal case, you'd have a pretty much um, diagonal only Jones matrix. And the off-diagonal terms represent error in the in the instrument, so they're parameterized right. that error by the magnitude of the error is parameterized by epsilon one and epsilon two. So that's the, 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 okay. the magnitude of the crosstalk, but it could also have some complex phase given by psi one. And in the bottom, it's psi two, but also minus psi naught. But psi naught is the differential phase that appears also on the diagonal. So that's not really a problem. But the psi one and psi two would be unconstrained in the case where these the, where the mixing becomes small so i would argue that these are kind of un, numerically unstable parameterizations uh, that might might have been causing people trouble in the past um, and so steinbring it all followed 
Conway and Kronberg, and then Hylas et al. followed Steinbring and Conway and Kronberg. <laughs> uh, so the bottom, there's two separate equations shown here. The bottom one has the obvious epsilon one, epsilon two, and phi one, phi two, that might in principle be fixed by describing these complex numbers instead in terms of their real, real and imaginary components. But the upper one is harder to disentangle. Now you've got an, a phase term parameterized by chi multiplied by the sine of alpha, but sine of alpha is also tied into the... Um, You're trying to estimate the terms of those equations. Like yeah, yeah. Those, so these would be the model parameters that vary in your fit. Yeah. This is why I don't like the Bayesian approach, because you've got to integrate the process this crook. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and, and really, the, my, my thinking so far about these problems has really been limited to how does this wreck the Hessian matrix in my levenberg mccart algorithm, but I don't, I haven't thought, like in a Bayes, in a Bayesian sense, would it just say, okay, no problem, the unit, the distribution, the posterior distribution of chi is uniform, it's unconstrained, and, and would it handle that gracefully? Yeah, but it isn't, yeah, but it might be uniform in the bottom, but not the top. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Just pointing out for any patients here, you have to deal with the uninformative part of the bottom, that is informative for the top. Right, right. And that's things. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I. Yeah. Uh, just to contrast this, here's the equation that was used by Matthew Britton, and it's the one based on Chandra Sekhar's 1960 textbook and. Chandrasekhar in turn based his equations on Stokes' original formulation. This is the one that we were using where we described the receptors in terms of their orientation and ellipticity angles. The, the, this approach is nice. You can still uh, parameterize the crosstalk. So the off diagonal terms represent uh, cross coupling between your receptors, but the instabilities here are far away from the ideal solution. They're up, up at the poles where you expect your receptors to be linearly polarized. So even though there's, you know, we haven't avoided the problem when chi A and chi B approach 45 degrees or minus 45 degrees, we expect our solution to not be that bad or the, ellipt the ellipticities of the receptors shouldn't be that bad. And therefore the, the solution is in a numerically stable or where we expect the solution to be is in a num numerically stable part of the parameter space. Uh, so completeness, I'm just pointing out here an example of a matrix that has only five free parameters. There should be six in this Mueller matrix because they've taken out the scalar gain, which would have given the seventh degree of freedom. So again, if you're looking for a parameterization, uh, I wouldn't recommend using this one from Hylas et al. Uh, 2001. Uh, I, and then I guess another, I'm kind of beating on Hylas et al., but self-consistency as well, most of the treatment that they consider, they aren't, um, they, they, they're considering linear transformations of the electric field. They haven't explicitly said, and we're gonna consider impure Mueller matrices, but they've made a number of small value approximations in their treatment that ends, ends up producing an impure Mueller matrix. And you can see that with this matrix, just by considering a 100% polarized signal that's maybe all Stokes U or all Stokes V. Um, Stokes U and Stokes V would pass through this e equation uh, unper unperturbed, or the length of the vector in the UV plane would pass through this equation unperturbed. But you'd be adding, you'd be creating Stokes Q. So Stokes Q would come out with delta G on two, and that would create an overpolarized state where the, le the length of your polarization vector would be greater than the, the total intensity. So these small value approximations can often result in accidental impurities. And it's unfortunate, the reason I picked this equation is it's also the one that appears in the Pulsar handbook. So people just kind of take it from the Pulsar handbook and go forward. Yeah, I, I was just checking it indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, it has produced confusion in the past where somebody thought they were simulating differential gain and ended up with over, over polarization in their simulated data. But so, I mean, this is not, oh, sorry, uh, this is not the one that is now 
uh, available in uh, PS archives, isn't it? Yeah, this is not the equation implemented in PS archive. Mm. I, I'll show you. I'll show you that equation shortly. Actually, <laughs> one of those equations. Uh, there is another edition of the Pulsar Handbook coming out, so maybe we should talk to the authors. <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't expect this so soon. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is troublesome. Uh, so I would say this Mueller matrix isn't consistent with the basic assumptions of li linear transformations on the electric field. And, and this is kind of a good example of separability. <laughs> so the polar decomposition, if you look at it, is just a boost times a rotation. It's hard to separate the bits of boost that are due to non-orthogonality of the receptors from the bits of boost that are due to um, differential gain, for example. So this parameterization, if we follow it through, uh, <laughs> it's kind of long. Ba basically, I'll, I'll, I'll walk us through um, up here. Uh, I guess you guys can't see me there, but we're going to start from the rightmost side at the rotation about the Stokes E axis uh, given by uh, capital phi for the subscript ISM. So this is the Faraday rotation in the interstellar medium. And then moving in, we have the Faraday rotation that occurs in the Earth's ionosphere. And then this uh, rotation about the line of sight by some angle chi, which you could say, uh, I think is a rotation of the whole receiver about the line of sight. Um, then we have this rotation. Uh, so this, ah, this chi, I think, is the parallactic. Zeta. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> zeta. OK, so rotation about stop speed by zeta is the parallactic angle, if I remember correctly. This what angle, sorry? The parallactic angle, so it's the rotation of the Earth with respect to the sky, or the rotation of the receiver with respect to the sky, due to the rotation of the Earth. The sigma sub theta is the sum of the orientations of the receptors. So if you're changing their orientations, the, their sum divided by two gives you another rotation about the line of sight. And then we'll move in to the the boost along, ah, okay, well, first we'll look at, if we have another rotation about the Stokes U axis, uh, given by sigma chi, so it's just the sum of the ellipticities. So I was wrong about, so the difference in the ellipticities, delta chi, gives us a boost along the Stokes V axis. And the difference in their orientations gives us a boost along the Stokes U axis. And then finally, we have differential phase, which rotates about the Stokes Q axis and differential gain, which gives a boost along the Stokes Q axis, multiplied by some overall gain in each other. So if you count them up, there's gain, uh, differential gain, differential phase, and then one, two, three, four numbers that describe the orientations and ellipticities of the receptors. And that that in total gives you your seven degrees of freedom in the Jones matrix. And then the rest of this is the uh, stuff that's known. So we can compute this. It's complete and cyclical. Yeah. What's not to like? Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's <laughs> nice. Apart from the fact that it goes on and on and on and on. It's yeah. Like and, like. and the nice thing is so the, these four parameters that describe your receptors are the ones that we think um, very slowly. Uh, on long time scales. And these, this boost and differential gain and differential phase are things that can change every time you do an experiment. So you might apply different attenuation levels to change the differential gain and the phase of the electronics is temperature dependent and all sorts of things like that wandering around all day long. So if you, can, you can pull that part out and calibrate this part um, separately from you know, the rest of it. So it's a nice parameterization. And I don't know if maybe this answers your question, Natalia, but the other thing to note is every axis is represented. We have a boost and rotation about Q, a boost and rotation about V, and a boost and rotation about V. But it's not over-parameterized because you've got an experimental handbook, for example, the last two. Yeah, yeah. So you can, you can 
can disentangle those experimentally. That's right. So technically, it's over specified. Yeah, the way, the, the way it's written here, it looks over specified, but those other things are determined using separate experiments. But even if it is over specified, it's automatically seen it. Yeah. Rather yeah. than it buried in that other code in the other matrix. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So this is a nice example of a separable equation. Is that um, order yeah, it's a good good question. The the superscript one on three of those matrices indicates that this is true to first order. If you're if you're looking for an exact solution, yeah. So, uh, but what what I found I've switched around the orders of these matrices and it really doesn't make much difference. Like it might if you actually really wanted to know the physical properties of the receptors, um, this. The order in which they appear in these equations might impact the, the sort of order from source to yeah yeah that's uh, lots, aren't they? yeah and that that's kind of necessary yeah um, the, the, which would indicate that they're in a natural order anyway yeah but there's a long way from what it seems to be about right to it matter yeah oh, so maybe to answer that question in more detail the ionospheric and interstellar Faraday rotation, and even the rotations about the line of sight, because they all share the Stokes V axis, you can interchange them and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the, the middle part where you have a boost along U, a boost along V, and a rotation about U, in, in principle, the order of those doesn't matter, at, at least physically. It's all happening in one component of the so telescope. Good. I, I would say that the, or, the order in which you place those three transformations, um, uh, the ones with the superscript one on them, so the, the, the first order, to first order, this is how you can parameterize your receptors. Yeah. I, uh, the, the, the order in which they occur doesn't really matter because it's all happening in one, at one point in the instrument. And, you might get different values. You're, you're certainly going to get different values if you switch the order around because those matrices don't commute. Yeah, to first order. And, and ultimately, I don't really care about what the ellipticity and orientations of the receptors are. All I really want to do is parameterize the cross coupling in some way that doesn't cause my uh, solver to explode. <laughs> and then finally, the the differential gain and differential phase, they're, they're good as the last step because most of the differential phase occurs in the path lengths between your receiver and where you ultimately digitize your signal. So if the signals propagate through different path lengths, you get this differential phase. And most of the differential gain happens in at amplifiers and attenuators that follow the receiver anyways. So you can say this, this is all happening in the amplifiers and attenuators. This is happening mostly in half length differences. These three here are mostly happening right at the point of reception. And th this is just um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Willem. I think I've lost you. I can't, I can't hear anything. Can you hear me now if I'm up close? Oh, uh, yeah. That's, okay. that's better now. Yeah, sorry. We were just talking about the importance of the ordering of these matrices in this equation. And some, some of the order is important and some of it is not. Basically, the, the, equation, the components that have a superscript one, I would argue it doesn't matter the order in which they occur in, in this equation. But everything else has a, a fairly sensible order that should, should remain. OK, thanks. Yeah. So we're going over time. Uh, I think we'll wrap up. Soon, yep. <laughs> so tomorrow we'll talk about how do we actually determine that instrumental response using observations of known and, and unknown sources. And I'm putting known in quotation marks because the only reason you think you know it is because somebody else says that's what it is and they had to measure it. And how did they measure it? How did they calibrate? That's the eternal question. 